happy to be able to introduce uh, our speaker today, Joseph Winter. Uh, for one thing, he's one of our uh, lecturers here at Mesa, one of our esteemed colleagues, and also uh, he and I go way back because we were uh, lecturers together at uh, SDSU uh, many, many years ago. And um, uh, he has a uh, you know, long career where he has been in philosophy then, left for uh, you know, other exciting things such as being a pro race car driver. Uh, and uh, came back to philosophy, and part of the journey has been continuing over the years of doing research in Nietzsche. Uh, and uh, this is what he's going to share with us today. So it, it's uh, you know the um, uh, preliminary result of a lifelong journey, I guess, uh, that has taken him to a research project in Switzerland and Germany. And uh, so this is the topic of today: Nietzsche's last year. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. Do I have to get very close to this thing? Um, yeah, as Nietzsche says in the genealogy of morals, only that without a history is definable. And that makes it very difficult for me to explain what you're going to see today because it's taken my whole life to get to this point. Nietzsche was a love of mine as a teen and I had no idea I'd be teaching philosophy or becoming a scholar in this field. It just had struck me in the 60s that there was very little work being done on Nietzsche, at least very serious work. Now it's a cottage industry. Um, but the scholarship really, one of my pet peeves, hasn't improved much, to be honest with you. Uh, because it's generally scholars commenting on other scholars and they leave a great deal of what was original about Nietzsche out of the picture. And I noticed that kind of thing when I was quite young and that's what got me going to the Nietzsche house in Sils Maria initially and then to the Nietzsche archive in Weimar, Germany, which uh, in those days was in East Germany. And in fact, there's a facsimile of Nietzsche's next to last book over here. Uh, I put a few pages out so you can see what Nietzsche's handwriting is like. And I'd, everything about it has utterly fascinated me, which, you know, for students, it's sometimes hard to explain somebody's loves, but I'd have you think about some of the things that really stir your soul. And they're almost as inexplicable as to other people as. Uh, it might be to you, and that's why it's very hard for me to explain why this hit me, and it did. Um, and it was some of the shortcomings in scholarship that really got me going here. And I was particularly interested in Nietzsche's last year because he wrote five books in one year. It's very hard to get anybody to read five books in their lifetime, much less writing five books in one year. And then it dawned on me very quickly that none of the five books did he ever intend to write one moment before he started to write them. And the one book that he did intend to write, The Will to Power, was the one that he postponed and uh, left to his sister to, you know, propagate fictitiously uh, for Nazi purposes much later. Um, so that's why um, I want to talk about this. This is a very private thing that I've been doing for some 40 years and I'm not used to talking about it. And Many of my students in classes, and some of them are in here, will know that I don't really talk about Nietzsche in class much at all because um, it's private love and um, I'm not used to sharing with people and um, I'm going to try to do some of that today. Uh, Nina asked me, because, and it makes perfect sense, there's some of you know next to nothing about Nietzsche, and uh, I should talk somewhat uh, about his significance uh, today. And so, start with Freud. Freud uh, said, you know, that Nietzsche had a more penetrating knowledge of himself than any other man who ever lived or is ever likely to live. It's an extraordinary thing for somebody of his significance to say. And Nietzsche's premonitions and insights often agree in the most amazing manner with the laborious results of psychoanalysis. That's why in Ellenberger's uh, book, The Discovery of the Unconscious, is a very prominent section called The New Prophet, 
um, dedicated to Nietzsche in that book. And we have it in this library, by the way. It's uh, BF 135. Uh, why I should remember that shows you how ill I am, you know. It's, it's a, an advantage going, going to school when you have a damn good memory, and I was one of them. Uh, so it had always been uh, a love of Freud's. In fact, Freud often talked about, he tried not to read Nietzsche because he thought it influenced him too much. And um, he's, he also said in his youth, Nietzsche always signified a nobility that he always fell far short of. And I thought, well, let's try, um, I'm Weitzman. He was a Zionist leader, first president of Israel, and he wrote this to his fiance. I'm sending you Nietzsche. Learn to read and understand him. This is the best and finest thing I can send you. And to show you how prescient he is about this, he says, you know, another letter to us, Lichtenberger's paper on Nietzsche was not good at all. The French are incapable of understanding Nietzsche. They are too superficial for a revaluation of values, a famous Nietzschean phrase there from his last year. Moreover, this fellow Lichtenberger seems to have strong nerves, and that is a handicap in studying Nietzsche. And I figured, to, you know, I'm trying to find quotes. There's about eight trillion quotes I could bring up here, and I thought this tells you a little bit uh, about why I also don't talk about Nietzsche in classes. Um, because if you have strong nerves, you're basically you know, uh, going to misunderstand him. He causes what I like to call the urge to misunderstand to happen all the time. Um, and if you've ever had relations, uh, you know, love relations with people, you know how prominent the urge to misunderstand can be. And in philosophical literature it happens too. And Nietzsche was always a victim of this kind of thing. But it was, it's very interesting that secular people from the very beginning, have understood Nietzsche properly. It was only under the influence of Nietzsche's sister that we have a whole other group of people, Nietzsche aficionados, who have systematically misunderstood Nietzsche and misrepresent him. And this talk today is a little bit uh, trying to explain the situation at the end of his life here. He was born on uh, October 15th, 1844. He died August 25th, uh, 1900, so he made it into the 20th century. Um, but he went insane on January 3rd, 1889. The date's pretty close. He was, you know, losing a few of his screws uh, late in 1888, but January 3rd's a good number because he was still articulating things fairly well on that day when he sent some famous letters, which I will show you a few at the end of this thing. Um, so this brings us to the context. And to understand what happened in his last year, last creative year of 1888, we have to go back to 1886 when he had just finished writing Beyond Good and Evil. He decided to switch publishers. Uh, Schmeitzner, who became his publisher when uh, he was doing the Untimely Meditations, and we uh, brought some of Nietzsche's first editions here. And you'll see the Schmeitzner and Fritsch names in the bottom there. Uh, he switched, and Nietzsche always regretted it, because Schmeitzner was a publisher of anti-Semitic sheets. He liked publishing anti-Semitic sheets and Bibles. And for the uh, author of Zarathustra, that was a continuous irritant. Nietzsche didn't sell well. It was very typical of him to sell anywhere from 50 to 70 books, generally out of a run of 1,000. And by 1886, the publisher had 9,754 copies of Nietzsche's book still sitting around. And um, the publisher was eager to let Nietzsche go because, but he wanted to be paid for this. 
And Nietzsche was spending a great bit of time in 86 trying to get somebody to buy his stuff. And so he went back to the original publisher of The Birth of Tragedy, uh, Fritsch out of Leipzig, and he ponied up because of the lack of sales. I think he bought low. Um, and so Nietzsche was incredibly happy. But Fritsch was not going to publicize this stuff, and he wasn't going to um, um, underwrite this deal. So Nietzsche in 86 and from then on became a self-publisher. He, he funded his own uh, things. And Beyond and Good and Evil was his first one. And he was hoping to sell 300 copies. That would break even. He sold about 114. Uh, 66 of them were given out as uh, periodical review copies and you know, complimentary copies. And that really took a lot of wind out of Nietzsche's sales. But what's significant about 86 was this was the first time as a self-publisher that Nietzsche tried to promote his own work. And in November 8th, he made a whole list uh, for Fritsch to send copies of Beyond and Good and Evil to a variety of people all over Europe. Uh, again, there were 66 of these sent out. Uh, on November 9th, the next day, uh, Nietzsche wrote a second letter to Fritsch adding to the number of people to get copies. And one of the people he sent it to was a Danish intellectual named George Brandis. And that is the pivotal moment that created the great creative production out of Nietzsche in his last year was that act. Brandis did not acknowledge the book. And another year went by. And in 87, Nietzsche did the genealogy of morals. And he did the same thing. He made a list of people who were to get new copies of this book. One of them, he sent it again to George Brandis. And Brandis, for the first time, acknowledged it in December. Because Nietzsche's productive explosion basically dates from the interaction with Georg Brandis, um, starting with this first letter that Nietzsche got on December 2nd, 1887. And uh, Nietzsche was always bothered by, and as you can see, bothered by the, the lack of interest in things. And he kept promising uh, he's going to work on something. Oddly, in the genealogy of morals, in the next to last section, he announces this will to power here. And um, he never wrote it. And Nietzsche's last year is fascinating to me. Here a man in publication announces a work in progress and uh, ends up writing five other books. And that, ever since I was a teen, utterly fascinated me. And this is the kind of story behind this thing. These were the five books that he ended up doing in 1888. The uh, first one, The Case of Wagner, was accidental. Twilight of the Idols, he wrote it in 10 days in, December, in uh, September of 1888. That was incidental. Uh, the Antichrist began only a few days after that. He did that Got it finished by the end of September. Eka Homo, he started that on his birthday of October 15th, and he had that finished by November 4th. Then Nietzsche contra Wagner, he started that on December 10th and finished it on December 15th. And then he collapsed on January 3rd. Um, the publication problems. The publisher was just dying for Nietzsche to sell these books he had on his hands. And so Nietzsche was always writing about this problem of trying to get a review of Nietzsche's works. There actually was a review of Beyond Good and Evil done in 1886, but it actually kind of scared Nietzsche enormously. Uh, because it was called Nietzsche's Dangerous Book. And it made a comparison 
with the new development of something that was called dynamite at the time. They, uh, if you've been to Switzerland, uh, they don't make roads on top of hills. They go right through the mountains, and so they dig a Julian tunnels. And they were making the Goddard Tunnel at the time using dynamite. And the reviewer, Joseph Vidman, made the remark that just as at the Goddard Tunnel, they have red flags out saying that there's explosives here and it's dangerous, so should this book have a red flag on it to warn people. Nietzsche was bothered by this because in Germany in these days and all through Europe, there was a uh, uh, confiscation problems with books that insulted Christianity or insulted God or questioned God's existence and things like that. And Nietzsche mentioned that he was afraid that it was drawing attention to him a little too soon. Right? So he's lamenting this thing where he says, you know, nobody's had the courage to discover me. And this is what Georg Brands did for him. And it changed the whole mental attitude that Nietzsche had in his last year. It made him feel really good. Brands wrote his letter in, in uh, uh, December 2nd, 1887. And it begins, I just received your book. And he comments about, I, I appreciate the fact that you sent me Beyond Good and Evil, and I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge that. I've just received your book here, and I wanted to thank you so much for it. Secondly, you weren't unknown to me, because I have your book, uh, Human All Too Human, also with me. And he made a number of remarks regarding how he feels about this. As the letter went, it says, a year ago your publisher sent me an interesting work, Beyond Good and Evil, in the same way I've re recently received your newest book. Um, I hope by degrees to read everything of yours very carefully. This time I feel that I must express my sincere thanks to you for your gift. I consider it an honor to be known by you and to be so known that you wish to win me as a reader. Your books bring me in touch with a new and original mind. I do not yet understand what I have read, nor do I exactly grasp your drift. But there is a great deal at first sight with which my own views are in sympathy, such as the underrating of uh, ascetic ideals, the deeply rooted aversion to democratic mediocrity, and your aristocratic radicalism. Your scorn of a morality of pity is not yet quite clear to me, nor was my line of thought completely at yours uh, um, in your uh, generalizations on women as a whole in the other book. You know? uh, Nietzsche's uh, thoughts on uh, women are uh, incredibly secondhand. He, uh, he and uh, Strindberg and uh, Schopenhauer could have had a hell of a conversation. Um, but I've always thought for students, you just ignore that stuff. If, if you had his mother and his sister, um, you'd probably have a problem too. You know? But we'll talk about his sister later. Um, he says, I know nothing of you personally. I'm astonished to see that you're a professor and a doctor, and I congratulate you on being intellectually so little of a professor. I'm equally ignorant of much uh, uh, of you as about myself. My writings uh, merely attempt the solution of certain modest problems. The majority of them only exist in Danish. I have not written in German for several years. And on and on it went. And Nietzsche responded back uh, on that December 2nd. And he really liked that aristocratic radicalism, though. He said, that's about the cleverest thing I've heard said about me up to this time. Um, and he actually called Brandes, Brandes didn't understand this at first, but Nietzsche called him a good European. When in those days you were Danish, you were German, you were French, you know, you were Polish, you were Italian. But he called him a good European. And uh, Brandes, in the next year, uh, remarked about this. And um, this started a friendship that went through the whole year. And there was a series of letters that went back and forth. What happened in January was 
if you saw in that other slide, the publisher had been offering uh, anyone who would write a review about Nietzsche's works basically the whole set of books to make a comment, uh, to write a longish review about. Uh, Karl Spitteler, who was an acquaintance of Nietzsche, Nietzsche helped him uh, get a position at Der Kunstwart, which was an art magazine as a regular writer, and Nietzsche had liked him. Well, the books were sent to Spittler, and Spittler wrote a year-end review in Der Bund on January 1st. Uh, it's a Swiss newspaper, uh, kind of longish. And it's odd that at the end of January, despite this review of Spittler's coming out, uh, he says that he hasn't been reviewed yet. And it's uh, in Echo Homo that you see a passage that probably highlights what Nietzsche's problem is. It says, it was not in Germany, but Switzerland that produced the two extreme cases. An essay by Widmann in uh, Der Bund uh, about uh, Beyond Good and Evil under the title Nietzsche's, Danger Nietzsche's Dangerous Book and a comprehensive report about my books in general by Karl Spittler, also in Der Bund, represents a maximum in my life. I refrain from saying of what? The latter treated my Zarathustra, for example, as an advanced exercise in style and expressed the wish uh, that later I might provide some content as well. When Nietzsche wrote Spittler, he wrote a very sarcastic letter, you know, thanking him for this review. And this is what Spittler wrote back, you know. Not being a philosopher, I had all these books dumped on me and I had to write something and so he apologized for it. Nietzsche showed no animosity. He helped him uh, get another position and he found a publisher for uh, Spittler's works. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 1919. Uh, that was one of those political things. He was anti-German and you know after World War I that was favorable so it was in the climate. And I don't think he really earned his uh, Nobel Prize. Um, which is not unprecedented, you know. Um, you know, and never has been, right? But uh, the people at the Nobel Committee wanted to uh, say something on behalf of anti-imperialism and all that kind of stuff, and hence he won it. But Spittler uh, became good friends with him. Uh, a very rare thing. Um, Spittler wrote this book in 1908, and uh, it's my dealings with Nietzsche, which goes over the notes that they shared with one another and how they, by the end of the year, they became very close friends and collaborators. In fact, Spittler was very instrumental in getting the case of Wagner um, appreciated in magazines by writing very glowing articles about it. In February, as he went in here, he had already begun work on that Will to Power uh, book. If you look in Nietzsche's manuscripts, you can see the work he was doing. And it got misrepresented. There's a book called uh, Nietzsche's Philosophical Context that, again, is another example of bad scholarship, where it talks about Nietzsche's paragraphs. Uh, that he was putting together. They weren't paragraphs at all. Uh, most of, it's very hard to characterize this. There's 374 points. You know, I'm thinking if he had PowerPoint, we'd be seeing bullets. And most of them are one word, and a great many of them are phrases. But there's not a single complete sentence in any of these things. And so he was making out an outline for this uh, stuff, and it was driving him nuts. Um, and this put him in a situation where he was ready for something Peter Gost said. Peter Gost was a friend since the 70s. He was a composer. Some of uh, Gost's music is in one of my albums over here, too, that you can see. He, 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 an undistinguished composer. Uh, he wrote a lot of things. They were played in very uh, small 
uh, recitals and whatnot. But Nietzsche had a very high opinion of him because he was so friendly. Nietzsche's handwriting, as you can see on the facsimiles I got over here, is so hard to read that Gost actually served as his copyist. Uh, in fact, after Nietzsche collapsed, Nietzsche's sister hired Peter Goss to read the manuscripts because they're so bloody hard to read. Um, but Goss could read them. And so Goss would very often make fair copies, which would then go to the publisher. And during this time, being a composer, Nietzsche being a composer, right, uh, made some comments about, you know, you said something about Nietzsche's style in your letter that reminded me of something. And off the, this letter got very long, talking about style. And what this was, was an emotional outpouring that found, found a, coales a coalescence in the book that became The Case of Wagner, that kind of unloaded Nietzsche's soul on Wagner. Wagner and Nietzsche were very close friends. In fact, probably Nietzsche was the most distinguished friend. And I, I'm using the word in a very technical sense, distinguished. You know, Nietzsche, uh, Wagner had a lot of famous friends, but not many of them were professors, and certainly none with PhDs. And Wagner knew that and liked that. Nietzsche had the whole second floor attribution to himself whenever he could get away from his studies to stay with Wagner. Wagner was in the attribution house when Siegfried was born, the same Siegfried that later shook hands with uh, Hitler. Um, uh, he was also at the attribution house when um, Wagner woke Cosma up. Her birthday was on Christmas with uh, an orchestra on the stairs. And it was always, by them, it was always called um, Treppenmusik, you know, stair music. It's called Siegfried Edel now. But um, they use that to wake up Cosma on her birthday. And so Nietzsche was very intimate with Wagner. But in the middle 70s, when Wagner moved to Bayreuth, the overt racism of Wagner became very hard to ignore. And it was largely on these issues and a few others that Wagner and Nietzsche split. Wagner uh, interfered with Nietzsche's life. Nietzsche was always sick and Nietzsche, uh, Wagner would write letters to Nietzsche's doctor suggesting that he masturbated too much. You know? And that got back to Nietzsche and it, it just would help uh, seal this break. Um, it was a great deal of an emotional break. All of the Wagnerites at the time knew of Nietzsche as the number one guy. That's why it's very common to think that until Nietzsche collapsed, Nietzsche was an unknown. He was an unknown philosophically. He was very well known by the intellectual elite throughout Europe, uh, mainly through his connection with Wagner. And because uh, Nietzsche wrote a couple of books in support of Wagner. Uh, the birth of tragedy is inseparable from a encomium of Wagnerian ideas and Nietzsche always regretted that later. And then he wrote uh, Richard Wagner and Bayreuth which was the fourth of the untimely meditations which was kind of a shameless uh, uh, shilling for Wagner that Nietzsche later regretted. Wagner died in 1883, in December or, uh, February 3rd, 1883. And by 1888, Nietzsche had a lot to unload on Wagner. And this is when it started with this letter that Gost wrote. During this time, in the very early spring of 1888, Nietzsche was very busy reading Julius Wellhausen, who was very famous for the documentary thesis of biblical um, analysis that was totally accepted now. In fact, Wellhausen's ideas have only been very recently eclipsed. He was the first guy to argue in the Prologamina to a History of Israel the belief that the Old Testament was written by numerous authors. 
Uh, he picked four in particular, and that's only what's been superseded recently. We, we've discovered many more authors, but Wellhausen was the person who uh, advocated this thought, and Nietzsche was reading him, quoting him extensively in his notebooks, and making comments about him in his notebooks. Knowing what was coming in Nietzsche's writing, one can see the formulations of many of the ideas of the Antichrist being percolated here. Because Wellhausen was interested in the priestly cl classes of early Israel. And anyone familiar with uh, Nietzsche's notions about priestly classes and stuff uh, in his later works of this year, um, you find the, the derivation right here in uh, Wellhausen. But you can kind of see what's going on. He's still working on the will to power in March, but in February this Wagner thing had uh, caught his ear, and he was working on this stuff. In April, Nietzsche got a letter from Brandis. Again, early on, Nietzsche asked his publisher, send all my books to uh, Brandis, please. And it took a couple of months before Brandis got them. And uh, it was about March, about the middle of March, when he finally got the books. And then in very early April, Brandis writes Nietzsche, you know, I picked up one of your books and uh, suddenly seized by desire to make you known in one blow. And this is when Brandis announced a series of lectures, first time for Nietzsche, series of lectures uh, in uh, Copenhagen on Nietzsche's stuff. And ah, oh, Nietzsche was thrilled beyond measure. Uh, because Brandis did not have that urge to misunderstand. If he didn't understand something, he asked questions. He didn't assume. And that was so important for anyone even reading Nietzsche today. Uh, making assumptions while reading Nietzsche is dangerous. Um, but Brandis decided to do this series of lectures. The first few lectures were not very well attended. And as Brandis wrote in his letters, because you're completely unknown here. But they were publicized in the newspapers, and by the end of the lectures, there was standing room only. Brandis wrote them back later. He says, uh, there was a great ovation, and it wasn't meant for me. Ah, Nietzsche just quoted that incessantly to his friends and stuff. It just it made all the world in to be appreciated a little bit. And uh, it was during this time that he moved to Turin at the suggestion of Gost. And um, this is where he eventually collapsed. Uh, Nietzsche kind of followed the sun. Uh, he very often stayed in uh, the south of France in the uh, winter. He would go to Sils Maria in Switzerland in the summer and kind of follow the sun, as it were. Um, and so he moved to Turin, and he was absolutely delighted with this place. Um, it's still untouched. It's not like a lot of European countries that have modernized uh, or were destroyed in a war and rebuilt. Uh, you know, you go to Berlin today, that's not old Berlin. You know? uh, many, many of the cities uh, suffered immensely, but not Turin. And that's Nietzsche's room up there on the plaza. Um, but during this time, now he's hard at work, working on the case of Wagner. Uh, he was really kind of bothered by so because he was telling some jokes. And it had to do with the intimacy that Nietzsche had with Wagner uh, early in his life. Wagner was in the habit of teasing Cosma, uh, his wife. Cosma Wagner was the daughter of the composer Franz Liszt. And she ran away with Wagner while still married to the conductor who always conducted Wagner's music, you know. But Hans von Bülow, her husband, liked the gig so much that he swallowed his pride and let his wife go, right? Um, but uh, because of this intimacy, 
Nietzsche had said at the dinner table many times with Wagner, and one of the things Wagner liked to do was tease his wife about his possible ancestry. Um, based on pictures, remember no photographs in the early 1800s, based on pictures, Wagner doesn't look like his dad, but he looks an awful lot like the friend of his dad's. Right? A man named Geyer. And in the uh, case of Wagner, Nietzsche almost tortured himself, putting it in, taking it out, putting it in, taking out a joke that doesn't ring very well in English. Uh, Geyer is uh, German for vulture. Adler is German for eagle. And Nietzsche's joke in the case of Wagner that infuriated all the Wagnerites was a vulture is almost an eagle. Now, there's another half of the joke. You know, if you're German, you get it, but most Americans wouldn't. You know, you can kind of see the comparison working here. What made it uh, nasty in uh, Wagnerian circles is Geyer is kind of 50 50 when it comes to a Jewish name. Adler is always a Jewish name. They so said, you know, Geyer is almost an Adler, you know? And that is kind of what Richard Wagner would tease his wife about. You know, what do you think about uh, maybe sleeping in bed with a Jew? You know? Um, and so that was always understood privately among Wagnerians, but for Nietzsche to put it in a book like this really kind of caused a sensation. Again, this is the ovation. By May, Nietzsche decided to make this, his notes into a book. It's, it's, it's much more of a pamphlet. You wouldn't really call it a book, but this is where Nietzsche emotionally unloaded him himself. And you can see because there's an epilogue and there's two postscripts. He just kept thinking of something else to say. And, uh, but it's a very paltry book as far as books, and it wasn't his intention. He had been trying to do the will to power. And here he is getting into the summer, and uh, Nietzsche spoke to friends that, you know, this summer is turning into uh, in you know, in the, in the drink, we might say in English. And so he uh, moved, he's in Switzerland in June, still doing uh, updates on the case of Wagner, uh, using Gost as a copyist and going back and forth because it's about music. And Gost being a musician, he can cover many of these points. And he's feeling pretty good about this stuff. Um, Sils Maria is in the other end of that lake down there. Uh, I'm taking the picture from uh, Sorle, which is uh, in the Ecahoma, he talks about a powerful pyramidal rock where he, the thought of the eternal reoccurrence came to him, and it's just off to the left over there. But talking with Brandis, uh, the problem of confiscation kept coming to mind. Brandis was talking about how his own books were being confiscated in Russia and having troubles. And he said, you know, your books are forbidden in Russia. And the only book you can get in Russia is Human All Too Human. And this really started to prey on Nietzsche's mind and led to what I like to call the cloaking of the will to power uh, later on in this year, because he didn't want word to go out on this. You know, it, it turned out the Antichrist was going to be the first book of the revaluation of all values. And if the authorities heard this is the first book, he didn't want to let them know that there's three more coming too, you know, and get him ready. Something very odd happened in the summer. And this had to do with a character, Julius Kafton who's never mentioned in Nietzsche stuff. Julius Kafton, um, he was a professor of dogmatics at the University of Berlin. 
uh, in the early part of 1888. He just finished a two-volume work. Uh, I got one of them over here. The Truth of the Christian Religion. Right? Mm, copies over there. Julius Kaftan had been a professor at the University of Basel at the same time as Nietzsche right? before he went to Berlin. Although not in the same field, nor close colleagues, they often ate in the same restaurant frequented by professors in Basel, and they knew each other. Okay. After finishing his book on the truth of the Christian religion, he and his wife went to Sils Maria, Switzerland for vacation. Staying at the very hotel, the Hotel Appenrosa, uh, that Nietzsche always ate his lunch at. By Kafka's own testimony, Nietzsche met up with him on the first day there, and for three weeks they went on daily walks together. Right. And then sometime later, 18, or 19, 1906, Julius Kaftan wrote a book about it, about his encounter with Nietzsche. You know, it's um, out of the uh, workshop of the Superman. Yeah, he, they went on daily walks together. You know, here, here's a man who wrote The Truth of the Christian Religion, two volumes, talking about the role of truth in Christianity. And this is from the first week of November or, uh, of August into near the last week of August. And on September 3rd, Nietzsche begins the Antichrist. Yeah, that's not incidental. And um, yeah, and it was also plays a primary role, I think, for the uh, style that you see in Twilight of the Idols, which is really an experiment of styles in there. He doesn't stick to aphorisms. There's, it begins with aphorisms. Number nine is a famous one most non-Nietzsche people even know. Uh, that which does not destroy me makes me stronger, right? which is incomplete. It's the total aphorism, out of the field hospital of life, that which does not destroy me makes me stronger. And, um, but you can see uh, echoes of all the things that have been happening up to this time in Twilight of the Idols. There's a section, what the Germans lack. Brands, Brandis, in that first letter of December 2nd, 1887, had written Nietzsche and said, I find you very German. And, you know, that wasn't taken as a compliment, you know. Uh, Nietzsche was trying like heck to uh, separate himself from that kind of stuff. But Brandis uh, understood later. He didn't mean offense or anything like that. Nietzsche didn't take it that way. But um, the impact that uh, Kaftan had at this time could be uh, discerned from a note uh, that uh, Nietzsche wrote, not referring to him personally, but you know who he's got in mind. Not that I should like to underestimate the pleasure I have felt on several occasions as the innocence of people who said no to my writings. Only this past summer, at a time when I have upset the balance of the whole rest of literature with my weighty, too weighty literature, a professor from the University of Berlin suggested very amiably that I ought to try some other form. Nobody reads such things. Okay. Um, and in Nietzsche's letters, uh, he uh, called Kafka the most sympathetic theologian he'd ever met. You know, they, they really got on well. And it, and it comes across in this. Nietzsche's sister sent Nietzsche during this exact time a kind of early um, uh, birthday letter, kind of lengthy, but one of the things that uh, she says, because he had referred to Brandis in this thing, so you fancy yourself famous now. Find a lot of people who believe in you, Jews like Brandis, who lick from all the plates, you know. Nietzsche at this time, or Nietzsche's sister at this time, is married to the leading anti-Semite in Germany, Bernard Forster. Uh, who actually was very instrumental in collecting up a quarter of a million signatures to forbid uh, Jewish immigration into uh, Germany. And Nietzsche's sister helped him collect those things. 
Uh, this bad picture is Nietzsche's sister, uh, very late in life, uh, meeting Hitler in front of the Nietzsche archive um, in 1934. Nietzsche's had a long thing to live over, uh, to get over this thing. So in September, he's now begun two books. On September 3rd, the inspiration hits him. He starts reading, uh, starts doing The Twilight of the Idols, which essentially is a non-offensive book meant to introduce neophytes into Nietzsche's thinking. And I think this was uh, uh, predicated on trying to capitalize on Brandis lectures, that suddenly a lot of people who weren't uh, familiar with Nietzsche might need something because of confiscation issues and whatnot that becomes something of an introduction to his work. And that's where Twilight of the Idols came in. And I think also because of Kafton, that's when the rethinking of what the will to power is going to be. He drops the name will to power and starts uh, a book called The Revaluation of All Values. And the Antichrist is going to be book one of these. And uh, so by the end of September, he's got two books done. Very early in October, his publisher notifies him that the case of Wagner that had been published two months before sold out. First time Nietzsche ever sold out a book. Yeah, just, he couldn't believe it. And it was kind of all the rage. All the rage in kind of different ways. Uh, it's, it's hard to characterize this in contemporary terms now, but in the late 1800s, there was a huge division culturally and musically between uh, people who identified with something called Sukumf music, you know, the music of the future, and that was Wagner. And people were much more conservative, and that was Johannes Brahms, who kind of served to be the paragon of that side. And Nietzsche and Brahms shared lots of letters. They became very friendly. And it's because of Nietzsche's connection with Wagner that Wagnerites saw Nietzsche's switch to Brahms as a betrayal, and they were very bothered by this. Three people who belonged to the Wagnerite deal wrote a uh, pamphlet in October called The Case of Nietzsche, a psychological problem, you know. Considering Nietzsche was going to collapse three months later, you know, there's uh, something that's slightly prescient there. But it was mainly an insulting piece. Um, didn't deal with the issues Nietzsche was talking about. And uh, because of the sellout thing, that went on in early October, Nietzsche sat down on his birthday, October 15th, and began writing Echo Homo. That's my favorite book of his, actually. It's a review of all Nietzsche's books. And you don't often have that. Have an author write a book where he reviews his own books. I mean, wouldn't we love Shakespeare on Shakespeare? I mean, you'd rather listen to Shakespeare than any scholar. And um, it's an extraordinary effort. He started that on October 15th and finished it on November 4th. He made some additions. In fact, this is where nitpicking scholarship has uh, been picking over this thing. Because he kept doing little insertions, put, put this poem in, no, take it out kind of thing. And so some scholars have always made the point that he never finished Echo Homo. He did. He just was always, you know, nitpicking bits and pieces, and um, so he was always kind of playing with it. But it was, in the main, it was done. Ferdinand Avenaris, who was the publisher of Kunstwart, was publishing a lot of pro-Nietzsche uh, articles, one of them by Spitterler, another by Gost, that extolled Nietzsche's ideas in the case of Wagner. Uh, Avenaris uh, was instrumental in pu also publishing the attacks on Nietzsche. And because Nietzsche was friends with him, uh, he wrote about it. Don't you, didn't you think I was going to read this stuff? You know, what's, what's, why are you getting with these anti-Semites? It bothered him because Avenaris was Jewish. And publishing all this anti-Semitic 
stuff he thought was a little bit distasteful. It's, it's kind of hard to put in a perspective these days, but you have to remember that for a number of Jews, not only there, but also in this country, many of them weren't practicing. They were very secular. And, but it was like an albatross uh, that they had to carry with themselves constantly. And very often they would go to the other extreme to try to ingratiate themselves with forces that actually disliked them. Right? thinking that they're just going to be able to miss this thing. Uh, and so Avanaris, uh, as the editor of Kunstfart, would publish these things. Well, Avanaris wrote a kind of disclaimer. Because of Goss letters and, and stuff, um, extolling Nietzsche, the article extolling Nietzsche, Spittler's article extolling Nietzsche's The Case of Wagner, the uh, Avanaris wrote this in the paper. It is hardly the task of this periodical to intensify or darken the philosophical light that Nietzsche throws upon the entire culture of our own day, even if we were able to do so, which we are not. We are, in spite of everything, convinced that Nietzsche is one of the profoundest and most original thinkers of our time. It is possible not only to share Nietzsche's philosophy, but also to recreate it within oneself, and yet to have the highest respect for Wagner. Friedrich Nietzsche, Jr., proves to Friedrich Nietzsche himself, we must apply the general law to the particular instance, in this instance to the case of Wagner, and make a diagnosis. The cultural physician, Nietzsche Jr., gave Wagner a splendid bill of health on the basis of the laws discovered by Nietzsche, the student of civil civilization. The cultural physician, Nietzsche Sr., Sr., gave Wagner a certificate of illness on the basis of the same laws. Only a post-mortem on the patient can show who is right. For the time being, Wagner is still alive. The apostasy of one of the most eminent, and perhaps the most eminent, of the Wagnerites is a fact. If he had had given us a dispassionate and sober exposition of the reasons that led him to abandon his former attitude, we would only have to be thankful to him. Not, in all probability, because he would have convinced us, but more probably because he would have given us occasion for a sharp scrutiny leading to a refutation. The essay, as it stands, is a kind of present from a brilliant Phaeton writer who toys with big ideas. The fact that these ideas are his own uh, gives him the right to our deeper participation. But what remains, nevertheless, is a sense of regret that Nietzsche has been no more than a Phaeton writer this time. And that was very insulting. A Phaetonist is somebody who writes, you know, little scribbly articles that get filled in the newspapers and are uh, worthy of being ignored. Nietzsche wrote back to Avanaris. I am sincerely grateful to you for your criticism, even more so for the admirable words by Peter Gost. I read it with delight. You have, without knowing it, told me the most agreeable thing I could hear. This year in which a colossal task, the revaluation of all values, notice he doesn't mention the Antichrist there, confronts me. I literally have to bear the fate of all of mankind. It is part of a test of my own strength to be a clown, a satyr, or if you prefer, a Phaetonist writer, uh, as I have been in the case of Wagner. It is almost a formula of my philosophy that the deepest spirit must also be the most frivolous. And uh, this is what got Nietzsche uh, involved in writing Nietzsche contra Wagner, which was his last book. Because what Nietzsche did there, Avanaris is insinuating, in a sense, that Nietzsche was an opportunist in this. And in the Nietzsche contra Wagner, Nietzsche took passages from many previous, previous books of his, some many, many years ago. And he slightly rewrote them, just you know, brushed them up, and then presented them as holes to show that his attitude towards Wagner has always been this. It isn't recent, it isn't opportunistic, and he's not a Phaetonist in this regard. And that's how you get Nietzsche's Contra Wagner, which is probably his most beautifully written book. Uh, 
The idea that three weeks later he's going to be insane shows you how very sober he was uh, right up to these last moments. Um, this is a slight aside. Uh, Nietzsche was always reading a Jeune de Deba that was like an eight-page piece of paper. Um, mischaracterizing it terribly, but it's, I'm trying to think of an analogy for today. Uh, USA Today, you know? But it wasn't. It, it wrote about culture and whatnot. But on the front page, uh, Jean Bordeaux would always write these articles that Nietzsche was writing. I, I got copies of all the each day's newspaper to see what Nietzsche was reading. That's always been a method of mine to you know, to understand somebody, you ought to see what they're reading. And uh, that's why when you see in those front of these uh, newspapers daily, you see talk about Jack the Ripper. You see uh, trials being gone, gone on. A famous one is Prado. He was a murderer who they were excerpting transcripts in the newspaper, heavily expurgated, to highlight his kind of notoriety, and, and he was having fun in his trial, laughing and joking, and Nietzsche really liked that, because in that he saw a counterpart, looking back, on the pale criminal. Pale criminal is always consumed with guilt and whatnot, and to actually see a human being exhibiting uh, humor and whatnot in a very serious situation, Nietzsche was very attracted to. This led to December. When actually uh, in April, uh, Brandis had uh, given some books to uh, um, August Strindberg, and uh, Strindberg found a meeting of the minds here. Uh, I think there's uh, three pieces that you can directly attribute to Nietzsche in Strindberg's work. One's the stronger, uh, one's the bite of conscience. And um, the other one, I'm not sure it's going to pop in my head. But during this time, Nietzsche started reading Strindberg. He's, this is his last month. He read Comrades. He read The Father twice. And then the little short piece that he sent that became part of Swiss stories, uh, The Bite of Conscience, um, it was something Nietzsche read. You know, when you go to Nietzsche's library, uh, Strindberg's stuff's missing. You know, it's very interesting. That's why you have to be careful as a scholar when you go in there, you think you're going to, through Nietzsche's library. I think what's happened, because it just wasn't documented, I think it's Nietzsche's sister to ingratiate herself with people who sent her money, would send personal items. She gave Hitler, you know, Nietzsche's walking cane, you know. Uh, and I think some of Strindberg's stuff and other people's stuff, stuff I know he's read, is not in the library at all. Um, and the bite of conscience is one of them. I'm, I'm right in the middle of translating that thing because um, I want to see what Nietzsche liked about it. And, uh, but it's not in English. Kind of terrible. So I'm doing it from a German copy. Yeah, August Strindberg, wow. Yeah, uh, he apparently really thrilled to his, Nietzsche's ideas about women, you know, which should come as no surprise if you know anything about Strindberg. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure who was madder, Nietzsche or Strindberg, you know. I think Str uh, at least Nietzsche had an excuse, you know. Um, likely syphilis, you know, we're not sure, but uh, long-term effects of syphilis um, do lead to this stuff. It looks like he collapsed somewhere around January 3rd. And then he starts sending these famous letters. And these are some of them to Peter Gast, you know, sing me a new song, the world is transfigured, and all the heavens uh, rejoice. And he would sign these things, the crucified and whatnot. To Cosma Wagner, Ariadne, I love you. You know, he signs a Dionysius, you know. To Overbeck, you know. Although you have uh, shown little faith in my ability to remain solvent or to pay, I still prove, uh, hope to prove that I'm a man who pays his debts. For example, my debts to you both. I'm just having all anti-Semites shot. You know? Signs of Dionysius. You know? And 
letters very much like these, almost very identically, sent to the Pope, the Pope's secretary, Prince Bismarck, you know, the Kaiser, you know, and lots of other friends and colleagues. It looks like there's about 30 of them that got sent out. Uh, many of them are missing out of the Nietzsche archive. I think, again, Nietzsche's sister, you know, uh, which, you know, because she, she was, uh, like lots of people we'd probably be familiar with, uh, was, uh, had a terrible weakness for money. So if you gave money to the Nietzsche archive, here came a memento. And uh, I think this is why uh, the Nietzsche archives ha has these kinds of holes in it. Uh, Nietzsche sent one of these letters to Jacob Burkhardt, the famous historian, uh, who was a colleague, older colleague of Nietzsche. And uh, this is when he said, you know, I would much rather be a basal professor than God. You know, and he goes on on. And then he compares himself to these murderers and all this stuff. Burkhart wasn't sure what to do with this. So he went to Overbeck, who was a colleague at uh, Basel, University of Basel. And he knew that Overbeck was closest friends with Nietzsche. Showed him the letter, and that's when... First, Overbeck sent a letter to Nietzsche, don't do anything, I'm coming. And then he just decided, I'm get on a train and go. And Nietzsche, as you see here, when he walked in, Nietzsche was on a sofa. And he was kind of trembling and whatnot. And apparently, uh, later, he would strip off his clothes and run around naked, you know, uh, jumping in the air and all these kinds of things. Uh, Overbeck brought him back to the University of Basel to the... Uh, a uh, sanity clinic, and he was diagnosed with progressive paralysis. And uh, his mother came to pick him up and took him to the insane asylum in Jena in East Germany. Uh, he stayed there for about uh, a year and a half. I got the medical records for that. And um, then the rest is history. Yeah. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. The one thing that I would do is tell, I'd, uh, tell all students, avoid Zarathustra. Zarathustra is a great book, but I think you have to understand Nietzsche first before you get into Zarathustra, because it's full of uh, allusions and full of metaphors and full of stuff that might not click with anybody. In fact, it's not likely to click. Uh, but it's a teenage infatuation numbers of people apparently get. I was probably one of the lucky ones. I just, you know, Zarathustra never really got me that way. I love it. But those passages, those sections that amplify his mature philosophy are really good, you know. His attitudes towards pity, his attitudes towards revenge, his attitudes towards a number of issues are very beautifully put in Zarathustra, but might be lost on somebody if you start with that. But uh, full books, uh, probably the uh, most beautiful is the gay science. It starts with a poem, ends with poetry, and so you can kind of see Nietzsche in a very mature way, you know, showing a lot of his um, strengths. Uh, incredibly well written. Um, his notion, the first mention of Zarathustra is in there, the uh, attacks on uh, guilt, attacks on revenge, his um, positive ideas are all there for look. His later stuff, I, I think uh, Twilight of the Idols is a good one. I, I'd put Twilight of the Idols and the Gay Science as two ones to begin. The, Twilight of the Idols is nice because it's a nice review. It's one of the last things he writes, so you get the latest dope. Um, uh, and it's, so it's utterly fascinating, but it's, he's bouncing off so many things going on that I just introduced part of these kinds of things today. Um, but it's not necessary that you know that to get that. Some of these other books, it's harder. I'm, my favorite is Echo Homo. But I wouldn't recommend that as a first read because the bombast and, you know, it's got chapter titles, why I write such good books, <laughs> right? Why I am so wise, right? The last section is why I am a destiny. 
And some people have thought that he was crazy because in that section, it says, I'm no man, I'm dynamite. Well, people thought that was not. Well, but he's just referring to what somebody else said in a review, you know, three years before. And, you know, if you didn't know that, you know, it's just not easy um, appreciating Nietzsche in this regard. He was given his PhD without examination. And in 1869, he began to teach at the University of Basel, along with Overbeck and a number of Kafton, very famous, Jacob Burkhardt. In fact, University of Basel is famous for Burkhardt. Uh, in fact, there's a big, thick book about Burkhardt and Basel. That's pretty recent. It's got a section on Nietzsche in it. So he started there in 69, and he had to retire in 79. Um, this is where the dispute begins about, if it is syphilis, how did he get exposed to it? You know, nobody's going to prove a darn thing. Um, you just speculate. My favorite one, in 1870, the Franco-Prussian War began. Be, to become a teacher in the University of Basel, he had to give up his citizenship. But he never got Swiss citizenship, so he was essentially stateless. The Swiss wouldn't allow him to go because he trained as an artillery officer and whatnot. Uh, they wouldn't let him go into the war unless it was a, as a non-combatant. And so he volunteered as a nursing assistant. And apparently for three days, he had sole control of three boxcars full of wounded soldiers that he had to take care of all by himself. That seems to be where his infection came from. Because you just don't see anything before that. There's a famous story that Thomas Mann weaves in Dr. Faustus, famous story that one of Nietzsche's friends uh, talked about, Paul Doizen, who became very famous in Oriental uh, philosophy and bringing Orientalism into the West. Uh, apparently, he told the story that as a student at the University of Bonn, he got a cabbie and asked him to take him someplace amusing. And as the story runs, uh, he took him to a whorehouse. And Nietzsche walked in, and as the story goes, he looked around and saw these scantily clad women, and as he looked around, he said the only thing that was alive was a piano. And he went over there and played some music, got up and left. Well, the speculation is Nietzsche came back some other time, didn't play the piano, you know. <laughs> So, you know, who knows? Who knows? It, it's unimportant, but uh, you see these stories. Lots of Nietzsche stories are weaved in Hermann Hesse and Thomas Mann and Trockel. Um, Gottfried Benn wrote poems about Nietzsche. Uh, and there, there's an interesting co connection. Gottfried Benn wrote Nietzsche poems. He's part of what was called the George Circle. When uh, Benn died, um, Klaus von Stauffenberg was one of the pallbearers. And Klaus von Stauffenberg, does that ring any bells? Huh? He was the guy that tried to kill Hitler with that bomb. Yeah. So, kind of some irony here. You know, Nietzsche's sister, close friends with um, Hitler, and Nietzsche seemingly influencing some anti Hitler stuff. Um, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. So, in 79, he had to quit, and he was given a pension, 3,000 francs a year, which is pretty good for back then. I mean, he had to live very modestly, but since he didn't have any family and he just kind of followed the sun and, you know, lived in small rooms and stuff like that, uh, he made it. Uh, that last, I didn't mention it, Paul Doizen, uh, met Nietzsche in Sils Maria in his last year, that August, and he brought him 4,000 marks, you know. Uh, there's some speculation. He, he didn't say who it was from, uh, but there's some speculation that it came from uh, Paul Ray, who was um, friends with him and Lou Solomé uh, earlier. Um, uh, an anonymous attempt to kind of bury the hatchet a little bit. It's, it's an interesting thing. No evidence of it. It's, it's, it's curious.
Nietzsche's, quote, problem was that he uh, was born in 1844 uh, and his dad died uh, when he was four years old. So he never had a dad. And he was just raised among women. And it's not all guys, but some guys need male companionship. And when somebody very famous, you know, offers you their friendship and uh, admires your work and stuff like that, that's very heady stuff. And I think what happened is, you know, Nietzsche knew about this anti-Semitic stuff. And to a certain degree, uh, Nietzsche even would use words that, you know, he'd kind of go, geez, that's kind of anti-Semitic. But there's, in those days, there was a kind of European anti-Semitism that was kind of like part of the woodwork. It's a little bit like, I even ask my students, do, do you hear the phrase, you know, are you Jewing me? You know? that still is alive. Apparently my students still hear it from time to time. And yet I don't think of anti-Semitism as much of an issue in this country. But some of these phrases and whatnot just continue. And uh, I think Nietzsche ignored it because it was so emotionally satisfying. But as Nietzsche matured in writing his own stuff, uh, mainly when he was getting into the untimely meditations, it was harder to ignore. Then when Wagner, you can remember, Wagner's in exile because he was part of the revolution of 1848 that all fell apart. And so he's kind of in exile. And his appeal was, he, he was like the Che Guevara intellectually, you know, at the time. And so he had a, a lot of appeal among, quote, revolutionaries. Well, that was fine and dandy when you're in exile in Switzerland, but when he went to Bayreuth in 1872 as, you know, the conquering hero, these faults are hard to ignore now. And Nietzsche went there. Oh, and the, the racism, the kind of incredible mediocrity. All the anti-Semites came out of the woodwork suddenly. And that's when Nietzsche got very sick. He would actually have a hard time going to the rehearsals and stuff like that. And that's where this break started happening. And Wagner noticed the intimacy, you know, that you're not with me anymore. And it kind of, and that's when Wagner started interfering with, you know, writing to his doctor, you know, Nietzsche doesn't seem to be feeling well, and I think it's masturbation, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, and then I came back, and so that was, uh, Nietzsche used the word perfidious, you know, that, that it was a perfidy that it just, you know, that finally like, broke it, you know. But there was kind of an intellectual difference. You know, the, the antipode that Nietzsche used to free himself of Wagner was Bizet, you know, Carmen. You know, the, the colors of the South, warmth and all this stuff. You know, there's something very Teutonic about Wagner that was uh, tough, you know, a tough thing to take. And Nietzsche's gaiety uh, took on uh, Bizet's widow started reading Nietzsche. She liked him, you know, and that was Brandis. Brandis introduced Bizet's uh, widow to Nietzsche um, and all kinds of uh, other famous people. A princess in Russia started, you know, reading and writing about him and whatnot. And this was coming back through Brandis because Brandis had his fingers on the culture. He was more the hub for information going around. And so that was getting back to Nietzsche. And Nietzsche's last year was very satisfying for him. You gotta remember, he, he was gonna be a minister himself. He went to the University of Bonn to study theology. You know? But as happens in all students, you know, you, certain kinds of influences you run across. This is what's, this is what's great about school, classes Classes can teach you about that much. It's coming to things like this outside of classes that, you know, really stir your juices. It's hard to tell what got him going, but he got onto philology, which is the study of ancient languages in the original. So he'd read Plato and Roman writers in the original. And that's what he ended up teaching at the University of Basel was philological stuff. And... Um, what made him go that route, drop Christianity? It's hard to tell, you know? There's people who would 
fight rather than lose their Christianity even today. Right? Back then, it was harder. But I, I think the character of people is hard to suppress. You know, when, when, you're, when your fo soul is finally stirred by something, it's something to pay attention to. You know? That's why I've always told my students, trust your instincts. They're trying to tell you something. It always irritated me as a student that all these professors who could read and write German and whatnot and read scholarly stuff avoided so much of Nietzsche that was just there. And that kind of irritated me as somebody 17, 18, 19 to go in and look at Nietzsche's you know, uh, notebooks. Why isn't anyone publishing? You know, why isn't this translated? I didn't get it. You know, it was really, you know, I mean, how many of these scholars are writing about Nietzsche? And they keep quoting from the will to power, which was the only part of his uh, notebooks that was published in English by Oscar Livy in the, you know, 19, in the teens of the 1900s. And so it was that kind of thing. I keep seeing it, you know, this, one author after another is commenting on another author. Whereas there's so much about Nietzsche, and I'm just talking about his last year, I'm not even talking about the other years, that is largely, because I, 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 you know, maybe it's my peculiarity. I, I think of lots of writers, I always hedge my bets, but Nietzsche is certainly one of these, that are very organic, that you have to understand a lot of things before you ever get to a point where you can kind of go, I know where this, you know, what he's getting at here. You have to really know that person well. And that's why from the earliest age, I just started collecting everything I could from everything. I mean, I got everything. I mean, there's, just, there's really nothing published by Nietzsche's friends or any of that stuff that I don't have. Because that, to me, was the fascinating thing. What did these people say? I mean, what were these influences? You know? And when I found Kafton and found out he wrote a book, and nobody, th there's not a single book in, about Nietzsche in any biography that mentions this, you know? philosophically or biographical. It's just not in there. You know? And it irritates me that as a kid, I find this crap. You know, it's like, hello, you know, it's just, to me, if you love something, you're thorough. And if you're not thorough, you must not have loved it that much. And that makes me suspicious, you know. And, um, you know, this little piece by Spittler, you know. Um, you know, these, these are just wonderful things when you discover these things and you just, you know. I'm a disciple of Walter Kaufman. You know, you're a Nietzsche guy. You know what I'm I, I was able to meet him shortly before he died up in San Francisco. And uh, I went over a bunch of this stuff with him. And he was surprised, you know? And, and he said some very kind things. He really was very encouraging about it. And uh, that's kind of why I'm kind of breaking out with it now. It's, it's been a private love of mine for so long that especially at my age, I'm not eternal. Uh, it's time to get, I, I feel like I owe it to some of my mentors and I owe it to Walter Kaufman to get this stuff out. You know, if you make a list of modern philosophers, significant modern philosophers, you know, we'd all come up with basically the same thing, you know, Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz and Hume and Locke and Barclay and, you know, people like that. You make a list of that? You see uh, something amazing. All of them lost one of their parents early, very early in life. Some of them both. Some were given away. Right? Wittgenstein, nothing happened to his parents, but three of his brothers committed suicide. You know? There's just something to, that always spoke to me about this stuff when I was young because it was just, I don't know, maybe it was growing up racing. Because, you know, I grew up watching people get killed, you know, because my dad raced. And, oh, God, was, you know, the things I've seen is unbelievable. And I think it's flavored my appreciation of life. Think of Hegel, you know, uh, in so Hegel scholarship, you got a big problem when you look at the preface versus an introduction. They're, they're, so, is, they're the same book. It's unbelievable. Uh, it seems very weird. 
But when you realize when he was writing this, he got his girlfriend pregnant. You know, and that was on his mind. That's why his publisher kept, you know, when's this coming? And he, he was constipated intellectually. And so the introduction's terrible, and it has that kind of intellectual constipation all over it, you know? Whereas the preface, you know, he got past this thing, and the, the preface came out, and it's, it's very beautiful. And I, I, I think the lives do tell us some. Just as long as we're always say, you know, don't, don't connect dots that don't exist, you know, in other, and don't make up dots. There's so many secondary sources of Nietzsche that just haven't been translated. I mean, you go to Barnes & Noble. See, I, when I grew up in the 60s, there was Kaufman, there was uh, Morgan's book, and that was about it, that, that were of any significance at all. Uh, then Arthur Danto came out uh, with an analytic an um, introduction to Nietzsche uh, in 64. And that's the environment that I entered into at the time. And as a student, I'm discovering daily that all the things I'm interested in are all in German. And it really bugged me. Although it did help me because I always postponed taking a language in school. But with my interest, I decided ah, I'm doing German, you know, um, to pick up on this stuff. So I do a lot of my own translating now. I have the medical records of Nietzsche. You know, in retrospect, when you look at the symptoms of stuff, it seems to be the effects of syphilis. Syphilis was the AIDS uh, prior to 1940, because there was no cure for it until penicillin came along. And long-term exposure to syphilis uh, is, typically leads to insanity. The French writer Guy de Maupassant, same thing happened to him, identical. And uh, it was very common, very common. There's just no treatments for it. So, you know, his enthusiasm, his brilliance, you know, you don't have to be brilliant to go insane, you know. But um, he was just a meteor shooting lots of sparks off. He's um, a, a, a kind of brilliance you seldom see. There, there's no German professor, you know, I mean a German language professor, who won't tell you that the greatest writer of German prose is Nietzsche. You know, there's just, it's, he's unreal. And he, even in translations it comes across. And that's why I have always warn my students, watch what you read, because the urge to misunderstand is always present. And um, you, you should, uh, you know, enjoy the humor when it's there, because he's often having fun with you. you know. That's why he uses terms. Like he calls himself the immoralist. Well, that's very easy to misunderstand, you know, if you're, you know, from the Bible Belt, you know, they're going to take you terribly literally. But Nietzsche's point lost on lots of people. If, if average people, if this is what constitutes morality, then I'm an immoralist. Yeah. When people love Nietzsche, they realize there's just nobody that you can put your hands on, as far as a book goes, that will make you think more about more different topics in such different ways as this guy. And so he just challenges you to just think. And that's a remarkable thing. Yeah, there's lots of, you know, structuralism, post-structuralism, you know, all these different isms that can feed off Nietzsche. Nietzsche's a very big carcass to feed off. I don't think you can understand the 20th century without Nietzsche because he's just an intersection for so many people in so many different ways that um, it illuminates things to know Nietzsche. Um, I oddly did my, you know, I didn't realize when, until I was a teen that I was intellectually starved. And I basically used Nietzsche to feed myself. That's what got me into art and got me into music, got me into a variety of things, because it just, the doors were there. And um, I, th I think that is the beauty of Nietzsche, you know, that especially since we're beyond this Nazi business now, you know. You got to remember the Nietzsche archive. Nietzsche's sister dies, 1935, November 9th. Now the Nazis got it. It's run by her nephew, 
Then the communists take it over because it's in East Germany. The Russian army takes it over. And since it's, you know, Nazi stuff, they shoot the nephew and, uh, you know, it basically goes in hiding. It, it actually was accessible. That's why I was able to access it. But everything's kind of on the QT because it's part of the Schiller-Goethe archive at that time. So if it's like, I want to go in the Schiller-Goethe archive and then turn down the hallway to go into the Nietzsche stuff, you know, they let you do it, you know. Um, but Nietzsche stuff's really only been free since 1990, you know, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and stuff, you know. And uh, to my mind, the accessibility of all this information should make some really nice work come out tying a lot of issues together. You know, uh, maybe students don't know it, but, you know, as professionals, we, we carve off a little niche of something and make it our own, you know, and uh, then, you know, milk it for all it's worth. Uh, and there's just a lot of things to carve out of Nietzsche. Foucault did it, you know, Derrida did it. Uh, God, you, you, I mean, you name the people, you know. I mean, that's why there's even a whole tendency, the French Nietzsche, you know. Um, but I, I've just always thought that his philosophy is understood. You know, as long as you got the Nazi stuff out, it's basically understood. I think it's key to understanding Nietzsche to realize it's unfinished. This is why I came up with a term that I'm using in, when I'm writing, that what most people are familiar with in Nietzsche's works is a diagnosis. He's a diagnostician of culture, you know, morality and stuff like that. But his positive side is not clear because he collapsed. And so the term I like to uh, use is that you can identify a proto-ethic in Nietzsche. In other words, it's not fleshed out. The details, problems, and whatnot are not, you know, absolutely. You can, we can speculate here or there a little bit. You know, there's latitude, you know. But uh, the proto-ethic is there, and that's what the revaluation of all values was about. Unfortunately, he only did the first book, The Antichrist, out of the four books, uh, which is what my thesis was all about, uh, trying to justify that he still intended to do the other three books. But what his positive philosophy was going to come out of that, you can look in the notes, but I'm, I'm very leery of that. I don't treat notes the same as something somebody publishes. You know? Heidegger is just the opposite. He, th he thought everything that Nietzsche uh, wrote and published was a facade, and that the real Nietzsche is to be found in the hidden notes that are in a vault somewhere. It's very, you got very weird ideas about that. But, uh, yeah, yeah, peculiar bird. This, this, he's got two weeks before he collapses. I received your letter and after reading it several times, I see that I am compelled to part company with you forever. Now that my destiny is certain, I feel every word of yours with tenfold sharpness. Remember, we talked about, you know, find a lot of people believe in you and all this stuff. You have not the remotest conception of what it means to be closely related to the man and to the destiny in whom the question of millennia has been decided. I hold quite literally the future of mankind in the palm of my hand. I know human nature and I'm unspeakably far from judging in any individual case what the ultimate doom of mankind is. More, I understand how precisely you, out of your utter incapacity to see things in whose midst I live, have had to take refuge in almost the opposite of what I am. Uh, what puts uh, my mind at rest here is the thought that you have succeeded in your own way. She's in Paraguay. She started the colony called New Germany that Joseph Mengele ended up getting to. It's still there, and they're well inbred. There's 14 families there, and they're well inbred now. And uh, it's still in Paraguay. Uh, and sh her husband started it. Quickie? Um, 
you have succeeded in your own way, that you have someone in whom you love and who loves you, that an important task is there for you to do, and to which your ability and strength are dedicated. Finally, and I shall make no secret of it, that this very task has led you rather far from me, so that the next shocks of what, uh, what will be occurring to me will not spread as far as you, because she's a long way away. This last I wish for your own sake. Above all, I ask you fervently not to let yourself be seduced by any friendly and, in this case, actually dangerous curiosity into reading the writings which I am at present publishing. Such things could wound you terribly, and me in uh, my concern for you also. In this respect, I regret having sent you the book about Wagner, the case of Wagner, because she used to babysit for Wagner, was close friends with them too, and you know, did all that stuff. Which, in the immense tension which surrounds my life, was a real relief to me, you know, just getting that thing off his chest. As an honest duel between a psychologist and a pious seducer, whom people do not easily recognize as such. To put your mind at rest, I will say of myself only that I am extremely well, <laughs> you know, two weeks, uh, with a certainty and patience which in my earlier life I never enjoyed for a single hour, that the most difficult things are coming easily, five books in a few months, that everything to which I put my hand is turning out well, the task which is imposed upon me is all the same my nature so that uh, only now do I comprehend um, what was my predestined good fortune. I play with the burden which would crush any other mortal. For what I have uh, to do is terrible in any sense of the word. I do not challenge individuals. I am challenging humanity as a whole with my terrible accusation. Whichever way the decision may go, for me or against me, in any case, there attaches to my name a quantity of doom that is beyond telling. In asking you with all my heart not to see any hardness in this letter, but the reverse, a real humanity, which is trying to prevent any unnecessary damage, I ask you, over and above this necessity, to keep on loving me. Sign, my brother. Yeah, your brother. So, yeah, uh, he, he, they were close. But, you know, I, I think you can be close to somebody that you really despise in other ways. You know, there, there's a kind of ambivalence, you know. As I joke in my class, you know, love's not a feeling. Because sometimes you wake up in the morning and see that thing laying next to you and you wonder where a baseball bat is, you know. And, uh, and the reason you don't use it, because that's what love is. You know? um, and I have a feeling uh, he would be tempted with a baseball bat, but you know, it's your sister. She, she's one of the most, she was nominated three times for a Nobel Prize, by the way, you know, in the 20s. And uh, became very f good friends with Count Kessler, you know, who was kind of a latter-day Brandis. Um, in Germany. Um, a very peculiar woman. Yeah, she was one of those kind of people who could tell you one thing right now and then tomorrow insist in all sincerity she never said a thing like that. And really believe it. You know, very ex uh, extraordinary woman. Willful. You know, she, you know, she had the brain of a gnat, but <laughs> she compensated with just sure arrogance and willfulness. She sued everyone in sight. In fact, this is what this book is about. This is two volumes. I only brought the second volume of this. This is Franz Overbeck and Friedrich Nietzsche. It's got a great amount of good detail. It needs to be translated. Uh, that was a response to Nietzsche's, or Nietzsche's sister's attacks on Overbeck because uh, uh, she hounded him incessantly right to the day he died. And she wouldn't apologize. You know, it was, you know, oh, all the Nietzsche friends and stuff. Oh, it really was bad. He equated Buddhism in some degrees with uh, Christianity because he recognized this notion of resignation present. But he liked the attitude 
more. Um, on, on a biographical thing, um, the person probably most representative uh, or most responsible for bringing Eastern thought into the West is Paul Doizen, who was a childhood friend of Nietzsche. And Nietzsche is the person who encouraged him, encouraged him to do this, uh, to go in. And that's why um, Dover still has the Laws of Manu by Paul Doizen uh, in publication. And uh, a number of Doizen's books are still in publication. Harper Torch books, Paul Rhoda, a good friend of Nietzsche's, has those books still in publication. Um, but Rhoda broke with Nietzsche. Rhoda was one of those serious types that just didn't understand Nietzsche. You know, there's just something incredibly invigorating about Nietzsche's writings that just inspire people. And so they feel that there's a derivation, but when somebody who doesn't share this looks at it, you kind of scratch your head. The, you know, the threads seem kind of thin. Uh, the way I like to joke uh, is, you know, being a Jehovah Witness is uh, a bad-humored attitude towards being here, and uh, Buddhism is uh, a good-humored attitude towards being here. And uh, so Nietzsche, yeah, saw these as both anti-life, you know, that life is what counts. That's why he called it amor fate, you know, love of fate and what not. Um, yeah, he, he wasn't pro that, but he, he liked the juxtaposition that a nihilistic religion could exist without rancor or resentment. And he, li he kind of liked that. Um, whereas, you know, Christianity was much more aggressive on this kind of stuff. You know, as a student in the 60s, you had Kaufman's works, and you kept waiting for him to do another one, you know, because there's more things to be translated. Then R.J. Hollandale, who he collaborated with for the Will to Power, obviously signed a contract with Penguin Books, and he started publishing the same books that Kaufman published. I was like, well, what's that about? Now, if you go to Barnes & Noble, you got the Cambridge series, you got the Oxford series, you got the Barnes and Noble series, which is just Oscar Levy's editions republished because you know, they're out of copyright, you know, and so they're shameless about that kind of stuff. Then you got the Penguin, you know, you got the Modern Library, and they're all the same books. You know, how many times you got to translate Zarathustra, for crying out loud? But you know what that is, you know. I, th I think that's a little dark side of academia, you know because you don't have to read German to come out with a different translation of Zarathustra if you just change it. I actually sat down and I said, you know, we're, we're fixing Kaufman's translation. I must have went 30 pages looking for a different word, you know? I mean, it was like, huh? You know? And I finally found him. And, and it's those words that Nietzsche likes to use, like dom dominant and domineering. And so you just, all you, got, uh, all you need is a thesaurus and you can be your own translator, you know? Um, and I don't think that's good for scholarship, you know. I understand it's good for, t you know, showing your college that you're doing work and it keeps the deans and everyone else off your back. Um, but it doesn't further what I was interested in. I, you know, why doesn't somebody translate uh, the Overbeck Nietzsche book? To my mind, uh, what scholarship is noticing is, you know, how kind of negative Nietzsche is. He just didn't get his chance to get to that other side. That's why you see a lot of proto-ideas. Like, I think he would have dropped the eternal reoccurrence, you know. To me, to me I just, I think that was an emotional thing, you know. That's, you know, we'll talk about that later, you know. But, um, yeah, he got that from a uh, poem from Heinrich Heine, you know. I found it in his library, and, uh, you know. It was a very emotional thing. But, you know, what his mature philosophy was eventually going to be is very speculative. You know, I, I think we can pick bits and pieces of it. In other words, he's very caustic about Christianity. Well, obviously he's not for, you know, everyone just a free-for-all. 
uh, you know, no restraints, nothing, but what's in its place? That's where you got cut down too soon, you know. You can read bits and pieces of it. You can see lots of hints in the dawn and whatnot where he talks about the uh, four cardinal virtues about, uh, so he says, you have to be polite always, you know. So it's there. But, you know, it's like stitching beads that are kind of far apart sometimes. I think you can make a nice coherence, you can make a nice case, you know, how ultimately convincing it is. Mm, I don't know, you know. Um, depends on the eye of the beholder, I think, in this, this regard. Um, and that's why I, th I think with, if somebody approaches this aspect of Nietzsche's philosophy with modesty, then we have a chance to understand it better. Because I, I think we just have to realize where there's gaps and just say it's a gap and not imagine something filling it. Maybe, maybe. But I've, I've always been of the modest type that he said so much about, I mean, he published lots of books. Why you need his notes to figure out what he says is beyond me. I mean, generally people write what they want to say. And many passages in his notebooks you find in his books and they're changed. And so he altered these thoughts and whatnot. So the final Nietzsche is open-ended. And that's some of the beauty of it. You know, had, had he later became a systematizer and if he became a Kant or something like that, uh, he might have become forgettable, you know. But as a diagnostician of modernity, you know, he's spot on. He's spot on. And we still haven't come to grips with that, you know. And so in a, in a, re, in a respect, I mean, to my mind, you know, Islam's meeting Nietzsche right now. You know, that's the problem, you know. It, it's a, the unacknowledged problem. Modernity is eating it alive, but it doesn't know what it's, what's going on. And I think Nietzsche would be a great spot to diagnose the interactions that are going on now. You know, that. John Wilcox wrote a book called uh, Truth and Value in Nietzsche. Did that in 70. Um, I wrote him when I was a student way back then. And he's dealing with those elements there. Uh, I, I would call it cognitive, but you know, when somebody's 51% cognitive and you know 49% emotional, and uh, it's you know, it's almost meaningless. You know, he wasn't Kant. Yeah. Um, you know, Hegel. If you read beneath the surface, he's a wild man. He just doesn't come across as a wild man. You know? um, he deliberately wrote badly, I think. Nietzsche couldn't help but write well. And that's his greatest danger. He, he just writes too well for unsubtle minds to get through without getting in trouble. I mean, but it's like worrying about why uh, Rossini stopped composing at 40. Hey, look what he did. You know? What could he have done if he lived, uh, you know? Van Gogh shot himself when he was 39. What could he have done if he lived to 90? Well, people who live to 90 don't paint that way. That's the problem, you know? You know? I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, how low, you know? Uh, modernity, you know, average the, the yokels that we are, sometimes has some very weird ideas about what creativity is like. And, I think you just have to stand back and watch the supernova go, you know? And he might get singed, but, you know, just appreciate the burst as it is, you know? On that note, what yeah. a line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> would, yeah. you, would you um, do a little bit of a show and tell for just a couple of minutes so people who want to see what okay. is here? And then uh, I think uh, you know, this is, um, you know, let's, let's say this is the. Thank you. Uh, the rarest interesting thing is I got this, this is a facsimile that was published in East Germany and I got it out of there uh, just before they collapsed. And this is an actual real size, you know, both sides 
of Nietzsche's manuscripts. Uh, this is Eka Homo's um, autobiography. And you can see where he cut and pasted. You know, some people have very weird ideas about what creativity is like, as if you've got to sit down and from first word to last, spill it all out. Sometimes new ideas come to your mind, and so you cut and paste. Also representative here, you can see how Nietzsche's sister made corrections. You can see how Nietzsche made corrections. They look like this. Nietzsche's sister, like crossing out. She didn't like him when he um, wrote things against uh, the Kaiser and stuff like that. That's where she crossed out? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, that's, well, she's very interesting. It's like letters. She would get other people's letters and she would burn off. You can see right the burns at the top. She'd burn off the addressee and pretend it was sent to her. I, I think she thought she was eternal. You know? Luckily, she left it all in the archive and you can see it. You know, you, she would just burn those things off. And Nietzsche also had a rudimentary typewriter. And so she made up about 40 letters uh, by typing out stuff. Yeah, and that, that's what she published because she was trying to make her relationship to her brother look like really cool, you know, and the anti-Semitism. Uh, here's the first um, uh, commentary on Nietzsche's Zarathustra written while he was still alive you know, by Nietzsche's publisher. Um, the music, it shows you it's, not, it's been around for a while, so uh, like this. Uh, Gestaltenum Nietzsche, this is all the writings that were, oh, is it the second edition? I got, a, I got a good version of it. What she did, she sued to have whole pages blacked out. They're all blacked. Whereas, uh, oh, there it is. You see a square here. I'll leave it open. It says, due to a, uh, an order from the court, this part has been suppressed. Right? In, in other books, it's all blacked out because she sued everyone in sight. Um, yeah, she was uh, two good books for that. Uh, if you want to read about her, Zarathustra's Sister by E.F. Peters. Um, is excellent. And if you want to include her colonial activities, um, um, yeah, what's the time? Forgotten, For Forgotten, Forgotten Fatherland. I was thinking Lost, and I'm going Lost. It's not Lost. Yeah, Forgotten Fatherland. And that covers it uh, uh, nicely, you know. But I'd probably start with Zarathustra's sister. She's just I mean, one of the incredible women of the 20th century. Along with Cosmo, you got to remember, all these women lived into their 80s and 90s together, and they hated each other's guts. But they couldn't write about Nietzsche because each of them lied. Each of them knew the truth about the other, and so nobody could, uh, you know, call the bluff. You know, Luz Salome lied shamelessly, and, uh, but Nietzsche's sister lied shamelessly, and Cosma was part of this deal, too. Basically, it's about two days after Christmas. When you those letters, you start seeing, ah, uh, it's he's starting to lose it. And apparently, when Overbeck got to um, tour in Italy uh, to pick him up, uh, he was told by the landlord that the previous day Nietzsche had collapsed in the street, which is probably where that story came from. He put his arm around a horse, kind of deal. It, it actually doesn't look, you see, here's the problem. When you go in the library, you don't see crime and punishment. Prima facie, then he didn't read it. But knowing that you know he read some things and they're not in the library makes you kind of wonder. Uh, he wrote, he read that, um, um, it looks like he wrote, read The Idiot, because suddenly he starts using that word a lot, right? And he uh, read a very weird French version of Notes from the Underground. Uh, it was expurgated, and uh, you know somebody took the liberty of taking pieces of Dostoevsky together, and, uh, uh, separate pieces, and put them together in a single volume. And that's Nietzsche started reading that in '87, just prior, and he got that close to almost reading Kierkegaard. Brand Brandis mentioned you got to read that, and Nietzsche said, "No, next time I'm in Germany, I'll, I'm going to tackle the Kierkegaard problem." Yeah, yeah, and he didn't. So, yeah, there's just a variety of stuff. Here's the, uh, 
this book's got the medical records if you want to see, you know, thing. He would jump up in the middle of nowhere and just go, behold in me the tyrant of Turin, you know. And he'd break glass and he goes, I'm trying to protect, you know, the approach of people, you know. So that was, you know, what happened in that uh, first mad year and stuff like that. It was funny. For that first year, some of his friends would go and they thought he was faking it because he could actually talk just about anything. If he brought up his philosophy, you know, he might really take off on you. But he could talk very soberly with the parents and, you know, with uh, his mom and his friends. And they go, he's not there. And in fact, some of his friends said, I, I think it's that, it's that mask business. He's just putting this on, you know. But it progressed, and it was pretty obvious. Um, uh, it was probably about two years when he would just, you know, shout, you know, much less coherence. Some writing, you know, he could write, I mean, his handwriting's terrible to begin with, and being mad doesn't improve it. Uh, and uh, so there's some scribbling that went on for about four years. And um, so... Yeah. So you're welcome to look at these things. Um, There's a variety of stuff from my library. Uh, so it's for the stuff. Okay. Yeah.